How do you keep your family healthy this season when it feels like everyone around you is getting sick? I use Sambacol. It's drug-free and scientifically tested to help support your immunity. Sambacol has the power of black elderberry in every purple bottle. It comes in tablets, syrup, chewables, or my kids' favorite, the great-tasting gummies. So this cold and flu season, support your family's immunity with Sambacol Black Elderberry. It's the only one I trust for my family. And best of all, my kids love it too. When I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. All right, yeah, our roster looks great on paper. Whoop the hell. Whoop the hell. All, right. All right. But at the end of the day, we better be a good team. And you start building that during this time of the year. Get your sorry ass up. Get your sorry ass up. Doing a lot of talking with somebody that ain't do shit today. Doing a lot of talking. Do you think you're better than Jarrell Revis is right now? I'm better than you. My 24 years of life, I'm better at life than you. Dang, dang. Time to go to work. Hey, that's sick. I ain't never seen you before, huh? Man, go tell the coach you need some help. We gonna expose you, boy. All right, we coming at your ass. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Roundtable. Let's go! Let's go! What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Football Roundtable Podcast, brought to you by the Full-Time Fantasy Podcast Network. You can find them at FTF Podnet on Twitter. You can find me at SportsFanaticMB on Twitter. I am riding solo today, so no guest host, but as I mentioned, we are being brought to you by Full-Time Fantasy uh, network. You can find a ton of other great podcasts, not just ourselves, associated with them. Some of the some of which are Jim Day of FF Champs, Corey Parsons and Doctor Roto from Series XM Radio, Bob Lung of the award winning Fantasy Football Consistency Guide, and the creator of the Midwest Fantasy Expo. Dwayne McFarlane, Blake Sullivan, and a ton of great others. You can find all of us on FullTimeFantasy.com. Your one-stop shop for all of your fantasy news, advice, and strategies. We at the Roundtable are also excited to be partnering with ExpandTheBoxScore.com. You can find them at XTBoxScore on Twitter. They have some of the best football Baseball, basketball stats, and college football stats in the industry for just $15 a year. That's right, just $15 a year. That's barely a dollar a month, people. You can get some of the best stats in the industry. For me, I use it for the college football side. It's very hard to find college football stats that go as in-depth as they do on everything. Dominator ratings, how often they're used in the red zone, how many touches they get per quarter, how many big play potential players they have. It's ridiculous how in-depth they go on every single player. They're in the works of bringing individual defensive player stats as well, IDP stats, which would be game-changing. And again, it's just $15 for an entire year and if you use our code round table you get 10 percent off of that if you follow me on twitter and you see all the college football stuff i post all the player profile stuff i do all of my stats come from their website if you were out of the playoffs or just looking to get a jump on the draft class now and want to dive into the analytical side of the prospects definitely check them out it is well worth your time expand the box score.com for today's episode, as I mentioned, usually I got Mr. Matthew Fox with me. We've got some scheduling stuff going on. He's got some extra work going on, obviously, as we get closer to the holidays. So through the next week, probably two, we're going to have different stuff as you usually hear me with other people going on. Might have a couple different people mixed in. Might be me by myself, as you heard me Friday. You'll hear me again by myself today, obviously, running solo. Uh, just, you know, due to the holiday schedules and everything, I have the usual broadcasting episodes, as you may want to call them, uh, will be mixed up here and there just with everybody and their schedules being a little bit different. I know Matt will be back with me tomorrow, so we will break down seven of the games for tomorrow. I'm going to jump in and break down most of the early games from the Sunday slate, and then I'm going to go ahead and get uh, the worst game out of the way so I don't have, Matt does not have to deal with me being an ass all day tomorrow. So with all that being said, let's jump in. Let's start talking about the week 15. NFL games. Prepare for glory! I don't know if you got your popcorn ready. Do you got your popcorn ready? I came out the wrong line already. And he's hit the end zone for an unbelievable touchdown. I would be honored if you played football for this team. Throw it up above his head. They can't jump with me. Golly! Only oh, tackle them the court yard line. Who can make a play? I can! Who can make a play? I can! Week 15 has 
coming. For the most part, gone. We've got one game left. The New Orleans Saints and the Indianapolis Colts will be playing tonight. Uh, I'm sure a lot of fantasy ba- fantasy games still in the balance. A lot of players on both sides in these games. Hopefully, uh, you still got a chance to pull off the win, or you're like me and in the couple. I'm only in two championship games left. Uh, both of mine have already been decided, uh, and I'm moving on to the championship game. So your semifinal matchups. Hopefully, you have won them, and we're moving on. It did seem like a week for studs. Last week was a weird week with a lot of players kind of going off uh, and players we were not expecting and a lot of the studs not really coming through. So most of them did, uh, but some of them having pretty bad weeks. This week, a lot of studs came through for you. So if you were able to survive the week 14 matchup or if you were lucky and had a bye, now we move into week 15. Most of those guys have come through for you and hopefully has pushed you into the championship. It's a great time of year. People make it into the championship games. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm a big Christmas guy, mostly just because you know, two kids and a wife. I love buying people gifts, uh, really close friends, family members, getting them gifts and everything. It's a, a, a great way for me, at least, to, to show my love to people. I love buying people gifts that they're not expecting. So it's a great time of year for me. It also helps when you win some fantasy championships to make up some of the money that you're spending on everybody. Uh, if you play in some bigger money leagues as I do, or if you just play for the, for the pride and the, uh, the bragging rights of it all. I know a lot of people who do that, and it's a lot of fun. I'm in a couple free leagues as well, and the bragging rights are, are a ton of fun to have. So let's move in and let's start talking about the uh, the games. The first one we've got is the Dolphins and the Giants. The Giants pulling off the win here 36-20. to Elon Manning, if it was his last game, gets to go out on a high note. We're going to start with the Dolphins, though. Ryan Fitzmagic, for the most part, does it again for when it comes to fantasy. 23-41, of 41, 279, two touchdowns on the ground, 33 yards rushing to come in at QB6 with 22.5 points. He is actually Miami's leading rusher on the year. That's just how how bad the Dolphins running back situation has been. It's also uh, kind of sad to know that Ryan Fitzmagic leads everybody on the Miami Dolphins in rushing in, in the 2019 season. I think that speaks a lot for what fantasy has been this year. Miles Gaskin does come in as the best running back on the day for them, mostly due to uh, he gets 40, uh, 43 yards on nine carries, but does add 29 yards on two catches to come in at RB32 with 8.2 points. Patrick Laird, I, I advise sitting him on Friday's episode. Hopefully you guys did not play him. RB37 with just uh, four or 6.4 points in this one. 46 yards on 12 carries, adds 8 yards on 2 catches. And of course, Devontae Parker balls out yet again, coming back from the concussion last week. Hopefully he didn't hurt you, cause you a matchup with him going out with the injury. Two touchdowns on 4 catches and 72 yards to come in at wide receiver 9 with 21.2 points. So if you, just, you survived, you're moving on. I think Parker... And obviously Fitz are, are the two guys on this team that are easily playable. Uh, I, I have actually, you know, I talked about it er, a couple weeks ago with, uh, with Matt on here that I'd actually picked up Ryan Fitz magic because of this run here with the Jets, the, the Giants, and then he gets the Bengals next week who, who can be beat. I think Fitz magic has another good week here. So I think both those guys easily playable and they're the only two guys really most of the season that have been playable for the Miami Dolphins and that continues. For the Giants side here, as I mentioned, Eli Manning, a great thing for them too, in my opinion. They, they, they pulled him out with just one play left. I believe it was Alex Tanney comes in. The backup quarterback allows Eli to kind of get a standing ovation, uh, gets a walk off the sideline for possibly the last time for the Giants. Uh, chan- the fans were chanting Eli. Like it, it was really a great moment for a guy who's meant a lot to that franchise. Regardless of what you think about Eli, he has brought them two championships, a lot of come from behind victories, uh, a lot of great moments. I mean, what I would give for someone to bring the Browns just one Super Bowl, not even Super Bowl, bring them an AFC North championship for Christ's sake. So I would uh, I would have been standing and applauding and ch- chanting Eli along with all those people if I was a Giants fan. Good for him. Uh, you know, we'll see if he gets to play again. The word came out today that Daniel Jones may not be ready by their next game, so maybe Eli Manning gets to go out there again. But I would imagine if that was his last game, it was a great send-off for him. He goes 20-28, 283 yards, two touchdowns, and three interceptions to come in at QB 19 on the week with 16.3 points. 
Uh, yeah, 16.3 points. Saquon Barkley, we talked about it on Friday. I said he had a chance to be top 10, but top 5 running back. Comes in at RB5 on the week. 28.3 points, 112 yards and on uh, 24 carries and 2 touchdowns on the ground. Adds 31 yards on 4 catches. Obviously, a lot of that was due to the matchup. We know Saquon hasn't looked great most of the season, but definitely comes through this in this one in a plus-plus matchup. Let's hope he continues that moving forward forward. Uh, they do have the Redskins next week, which are a team that is also beatable on the ground. So let's hope Saquon is able to continue that uh, at least through next week where most of our fantasy championships end. For the wide receiver, Sterling Shepard, wide receiver 14 with 15.6 points in this one. 111 yards on 9 catches. Golden Tate, just 1 catch for a 51-yard touchdown to come in at wide receiver 31 with 11.6 points. Uh, and Darius Slayton, for the most part, disappoints a lot of people. Really hoping he was going to have a good game here. Just 30 one yards on two catches does get you the touchdown as well. So for the Giants, I, a lot of it is going to come down to who plays at quarterback next week. I'm not going to pretend like it doesn't because as I've said before, Saquon just looks like a different player with Eli back there. Eli does tend to check down to him more often. He had five targets, four catches in this one. So actually had the second most targets outside of Sterling Shepard who had 11. Uh, if Daniel Jones is out there, regardless, you're pro- you're still playing Saquon, but I don't know if you can expect the performance we saw this week. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, regardless, you're playing Saquon at the wide receiver position. I think it is Sterling Shepard is a solid wide receiver too for you, regardless if it's Jones or Manning. I don't know about Tate. I mean, if he doesn't make that one play, he does nothing for you. I kind of feel like Tate's just a a. A bust for the rest of the season, if that makes sense. Like I would not play him next week. I would not count on Golden Tate, regardless of if it's Jones and or Manning. And uh, that, that's it. Let's go on to the Seahawks and the Panthers. Seahawks pulling off a 30-24 to victory in this one. Russell Wilson, 20-26, 286 yards and two touchdowns. To come in at QB8 with 19.3 points. Chris Carson, 133 yards on 24 carries and two touchdowns. Just as one catch for four yards to come in at RB6 with 26.2 points. Tyler Lockett. Man, was I wrong on this guy Friday. I was worried about him. I was talking about he did not look right. So this obviously is a game that he could get into, but I did not expect him to do this. 120 yards, eight catches, and one touchdown. I advise sitting him for Metcalf. Lockett has by far the better day. Wide receiver, five with 22 points. Metcalf, wide receiver, 37 with just 10 points, uh, 10 points in this one. Two catches, 36 yards, and a touchdown. 10.6 points. Uh, Big news came out in this one just a little bit ago before I started recording that Josh Gordon has been suspended indefinitely again for um, an off-field drug usage. I can't remember exactly what it was. They didn't say what drugs he was using, whether it's, you know, pot and or something else. Uh, I mean, at this point, I don't know what you can say. This is just not good, guys. I mean, he, he is likely done. Uh, I would almost think for his NFL career, maybe he's able to go into the XFL or something. So I, I actually think I heard earlier today the XFL is not that big on the pot usage thing. Uh, but Gordon likely done in the NFL altogether. As for the Seahawks, you're fine next week. They're still playing for seeding in the playoffs. Get the Arizona Cardinals as well, which is a good matchup for them. So Wilson, Lockett, Metcalf, Carson are all good to fire up. All great weeks. None of them really cost you a matchup in this one, in my opinion. So you're good to go moving forward with them. For the Panthers, had some big news come out about them as well earlier today. We'll get to that in a minute. Kyle Allen, 25 of 41, 277, one touchdown and three interceptions. Does at 25 yards on the ground. Comes in at QB 21 with 14.6 points. CMC uh, bounces back and pops. Pops back into that top three running back. You know, he's been in the, the 5 to 10 range the past couple weeks. Definitely comes back and has a good game here. 87 yards and two touchdowns on 19 carries in this one. Does add 88 yards on eight catches. Finishing as RB2 with 33.5 points. DJ Moore continues to be a very productive wide receiver for them. Finishes as wide receiver 16 with 15.3 points in this one. Gets 110 yard rush and adds 113 yards on 8 catches. And Curtis Samuel has a, a good game here. He also gets 4 rushes for 23 yards. Gets you a touchdown on 5 catches and 31 yards. Coming in as wide receiver 23 with 13.9 points. 
The big news for the Panthers here is that Will Greer will now be the starting quarterback this week, for, I would assume for week 16 and 17. Bad news for fantasy owners, I think, on that. CMC is good to go. I don't think Will Greer affects him at all. I liked Will Greer coming out of college. I thought he was going to be a very good player. I, I thought he's he's ready to play, but I don't know if he's necessarily the most pro-ready player. We saw Kyle Allen likes to target DJ Moore. My fear with Will Greer is does he continue to do that? DJ Moore has likely helped you get to where you are in the fantasy season. You know, we've kind of fallen off on the Curtis Samuel train all, all the way back in like week five, six, seven, because uh, while Kyle Allen was doing good, he was really only keeping one fantasy wide receiver afloat, and that seemed to be DJ Moore. I'm worried that Will Greer will not be able to do that, not because DJ Moore is not talented, and I'm not trying to say that Will Will Greer isn't as well, but we just haven't seen him play in this offense. So I would be a little bit worried about that. On the plus side, I am excited to see Will Greer play because I was excited for him. I like him. I think he could be the future in Carolina, especially if they decide to move away from Cam Newton after the season. Uh, but something to watch. Likely you got to play DJ Moore. We'll discuss it more on the Friday episode when we preview all of the games on what we think could happen. Uh, but I do think that might be a little bit of hit to DJ Moore's value in the championship round of the playoffs. Next up, we got Patriot Gate. Uh, the Patriots filming the Bengals and just all kinds of wonderful nonsense with that. I'm not really going to get into. Doesn't make any sense. I don't know why the Patriots continue to put themselves in such a bad position. But they end up winning the game 34 to 13. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of it due really to their defense because their offense didn't do much. Tom Brady, 15 to 29, 128 yards and two touchdowns. To come in at QB 24 with 12.9 points. James White, as I said on Friday, I thought he was the one guy I would trust. He comes through for you. 13 yards on three carries, but adds 49 yards on three catches and a touchdown to come in at RB 17 with 13.7 points. Rex Burkett comes in at RB 19 with 12.9 points, 53 yards on six rushes and a touchdown, uh, just six yards on two catches. Uh, Sony Michelle, I, saw, I talked about it on Friday. A lot of people saying this is the game script for him. This is the game that he's going to come up. I did not trust him. I said don't trust him. RB26, which is 9.8 points in this one. 89 yards on 19 carries, one catch for 14 yards. I did say to start Julian Edelman, and my goodness, that was a bad call. Just nine yards on two catches. Just uh, nobody outside of Nikhil Harry, and all of his came really from the one touchdown catch. Just two catches for 15 yards and a touchdown in this one. Wide receiver 34 with 10.7 points. Bad day all around for this Patriots offense. I mean, it's kind of been what it is all season. The only guys you could rely on were Julian Edelman and James White. Julian Edelman unfortunately falls flat in this one. Hopefully he didn't cost you, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if he actually cost my brother. In, in our main dynasty league, he, he's going to likely lose what it looks like by probably right around 10-ish points. And, and starting Julian Edelman and Emmanuel Sanders really hurt him uh, this week after after been being decent for most of the season. On the Bengals side, Andy Dalton, 17 of 31, 151, one touchdown, four interceptions. It's coming at QB 30 with 6.10 points. Joe Mixon, I said on Friday, was the one guy on this offense I was playing regardless. 136 yards, 25 carries, adds 20 yards on three catches to come in as RB 13 with 17.1 points. And then Tyler Boyd, just 26 yards on three catches. Uh, you know, he was getting blanketed by Stephon Gilmore. Wide receiver 62 with 4.1 points. You know, as I said, talked about it on Friday. Joe Mixon was the only guy that you should have trusted playing in this one. I know T Tyler Boyd is likely a, a high round pick for most people. But he just hasn't shown that he can be that great against elite corners. Not a lot of people have. And let's be honest, Stephon Gilmore's shut down the best of the best. So it's not even a, a, a knock against Tyler Boyd. It's just Stephon Gilmore's been that good. He baited Andy Dalton into a throw that cost him to throw a pick six. So just an all-around bad game for this offense against probably what's considered the best defense in the league. They do get the Dolphins next week, so that should be a good game for, for the Bengals here moving into the championship round if you survived it. But Tyler Boyd, uh, you know, as as I said, we suggested not playing him. Hopefully you didn't. Buccaneers and Lions. The Buccaneers win this one 38-17. Jameis Winston possibly saved his career in Tampa with this one. Came in hurt. Uh, could barely grip a football. You know, there's a lot of talk about he was throwing a tennis ball most of the week because of that thumb injury. Comes in, throw, uh, does 28-42, 458 yards, four touchdowns, and one interception to come in at QB2 on the week. That's right, QB2 with all that. 33.7 points in this one. Ronald Jones, 
Uh, 23 yards on 11 carries. Doesn't do anything in the receiving game. 26 yards on one catch. Comes in at running back 40 with 5.4 points. Brashad Perriman. So, we talked about it on Friday. Obviously, I did not know the Godwin injury would happen, but I said with Evans being down, Perriman was the one guy I trust. We saw him come on late last year with the Browns. He's had a couple decent outings, not great outings at all here with the Buccaneers. Comes through big time. Five catches, 113 yards, and three touchdowns in this one to come in at wide receiver one with 32.1 points. Chris Godwin, wide receiver 19 with 14.6 points, 121 yards on five catches. The bad news with that, he is out. He he is going to be out the rest of the season. He got hurt as well. So if Perriman is still on your waiver wires, grab him now because he will be the guy. Him and Scotty Miller. Uh, I would probably grab Scotty Miller as well uh, just based on the fact that he had a, a decent game here, 49 yards on, and one touchdown on all three of his catches. But actually most of the targets went to the tight ends once Godwin went down. Uh, Howard got eight and Break got seven, which are right up there with Godwin and Perriman. Uh, so maybe if one of those guys are available, you grab them and throw them in your flex. I think they're going to get uh, a lot of work going up against the Texans this week, who we saw could be beatable here in the back end as well uh, against the Titans of all teams. So Jameis Winston, I'd give him an edge over Ryan Tannehill. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens. When I said Perriman, if he's available, grab him. Next on the list of me would be Scotty Miller, then Howard, then Bray, if you can grab him uh, off your waiver wires with Godwin now and... Um, Evans being out for the rest of the season. On to the Detroit Lions. David Blau continues to be their starting quarterback with Stafford out and the injured back. 24-43, 260 yards and two interceptions in this one to come in at QB. Oh, sorry, I lost it, guys. My phone has been messing up on me all day and I really don't know what's going on with it. QB 27 with 10.3 points. Wes Hills at running back from, if you're watching this game, Slippery Rock, everybody was talking about a, a, a guy that a lot of people were actually high on out of the Senior Bowl and Combine last year. Uh, I was not one of them, but good for him. Has himself a day here. Get called up with the injury to Bo Scarborough late in the day Saturday. Actually, Saturday might not even gotten ruled out till Sunday morning. Uh, so if you picked him up and played him, Two touchdowns on 10 carries and 21 yards in this one coming in as running back 16 with 15.2 points. Talked about it on Friday in this game. Man, had a good call and a bad call in this one. I said start Danny Amendola with Marvin Jones being out, TJ Hawkinson being out. He has had a huge uptick in targets. Got 13 targets in this one, eight catches for 102 yards. Wide receiver 21 with 14.2 points, but Kenny Galladay, I said he was going to be fine no matter what. Wide receiver 50 with 5.9 points, just 44 yards on three catches. So Galladay could have been a guy that cost you a shot into the championship for that. I apologize. Uh, that was just, you know, I expected him to continue to be the baller that he is in Kenny G, and he unfortunately fell short of that. Bears and Packers, what a wild game this was. The Packers barely pulling off a victory 21-13 and probably could have either tied or won by 21-20. Like, it was just a... We'll get to it. We'll start actually with the Packers side so we can address that on the Bears side after. Aaron Rodgers, pedestrian day here, 16-33, 203 yards and one touchdown to come in at QB 22 with 14.4 points. But Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams, the only fantasy-relevant guys here come through for you. 51 yards on 13 carries and two touchdowns for, um, my goodness, for Jones here. Doesn't do anything in the receiving game, though. Still comes in at RB12 with 17.1 points. And Devontae Adams comes in at wide receiver 10 with 19.8 points. 103 yards on seven catches and one touchdown. It's ridiculous, guys. I mean, we've, we've talked about it all season long. When Adams is out there, he's the only fantasy-relevant receiving option they have. 13 targets in this one. The next most, four to Geronimo Allison and Jimmy Graham. Like, it's that's how much more Devontae Adams gets targeted. He is the man of this offense. And I also think with him out there balling like that helps out Aaron Jones. Uh, so they should both be be good to go next weekend again, it'll be a tough matchup. They've got the Vikings, but the Packers need to win this one as they are just one game up on the Vikings here. Uh, and they want to really secure that. They have a chance to secure the NFC North and possibly a first round bye with a win here as the rest of the NFC has kind of come back to them now in the
the Seahawks and the 49ers and some of the games that they have lost here as of late. So on the Bears side here, the Bears needed a win to stay in playoff contention, uh, and they honestly had a shot for it. Let's start with the fantasy side first. Mitch Trubisky, 29-53, 334 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions, adds 29 yards on the ground to come in a QB 14 with 18.3 points. Tariq Cohen, RB 23 with 11 points. Uh, 28 yards on 8 carries, but adds 57 yards on 7 catches. David Montgomery struggles and is just disappointing again. 39 yards on 14 carries, adds 1 catch for 10 yards. But Anthony Miller, I talked about him a little bit. He's a guy who's really come on here after the past, as of the past three or four weeks. If you've been playing him, you've been riding high and, and advancing. Guess what? If you played him, you likely advanced again in this one. 118 yards and a touchdown on nine catches in this one to come in at wide receiver four with 22.3 points. And Allen Robinson, who got robbed of a touchdown in this one, wide receiver 13 with 16 points, 125 yards on seven catches. So, if you did not see the play, the game, they, they, I can't remember what exactly led to it, but they had the ball right around the 50 yard line, for maybe right closer even to the 40. At a chance for a final play to get down into the end zone, you would expect, hey, they're going to throw a Hail Mary. They decided not to. They threw it short and then did the pitch play. The funny thing about that was, is that, so they pitched it, uh, they kept pitching it, it got to, uh, Mitch Trubisky, who then gets it over to their tight end, I believe it was J.P. Holtz, who starts running, and if you watch the play, Allen Robinson is like smacking his hands, I would imagine yelling at the top of his lungs, because he is wide open for the pitch from Holtz, to literally just walk into the end zone. Like, it would not even have been close. There was no Packers defender over there. There was like one guy who comes over after they strip the ball from Holtz, but Allen Robinson is likely walking into the end zone and making it a 21 21- to 19 game giving them a chance for the two point conversion to tie it and go into overtime he doesn't pitch it he gets tackled fumbles the ball Packers recovered at the one yard line just completely disappointing chances are the Bears are not going to make it in anyways even if they win that game but at least they get one more week to try and play it out tough for them they do get the Chiefs next week which is going to be a, a tough matchup that defense against the pass is legit. So Anthony Miller and Allen Robinson, while you've been riding a Rob all season long, and Anthony Miller over the past four or five weeks, uh, they might not be in for quite the points that they've been putting up here as of late, going up against a very good secondary here in the Chiefs. Next up, we are going to do the Texans and the Titans. So the Texans pull off a win here, twenty four to twenty one. Deshaun Watson, 19-27, 243 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions, adds 32 yards on the ground in this one to come in as QB 10 with 18.9 points. Carlos Hyde, he proved me wrong. I said don't start him or Johnson. I was not thinking either one of them was going to be able to do anything against this Titans defense. Hyde, RB 15 with 16.4 points in this one, 104 yards on 26 carries and a touchdown. Duke Johnson, though, just 19 yards on two catches. Hopkins, 119 yards on six catches to come in as wide receiver 18 with 14.9 points. Kenny Stills, two touchdown day, wide receiver 12 with 17 points. 35 yards, three catches, two touchdowns. Uh, if you, I've been talking about it for weeks. If you were able to survive, if you had Hopkins or Fuller, who did come back in this one, 61 yards on five catches, this championship week is the week for you. They get the Bucks, the worst pass defense in the league. I expect this to be a shootout. The Texans do need a win here. They can't play it safe. So likely if you made it in your championship round, good games coming for those guys, hopefully, to help you propel you to a championship. On the Titan side here, Ryan Tannehill, 22-36, 279 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. One rushing touchdown as well for 10 yards. QB3 with 25.2 points. Derrick Henry struggles big time in this one. 86 yards on 21 carries. Nothing in the receiving game. Just 8.6 points. RB30 did have the hamstring issue, which we talked about on Friday. I thought might limit him a little bit here against a decent Houston rush team. Uh, They're right a little above the middle of the pack. So it was a good matchup for Henry, but the hamstring, I mean, that's a big deal for players. Uh, Not surprised. Surprising that he got struggled in this one, but talked about it on Friday. Me and Matt have been talking about it for the past couple weeks. AJ Brown needs to be in your lineup. Balls out again. 
Eight catches, 114 yards, and one touchdown in this one. Wide receiver seven with 21.4 points. And before we talk more on Brown, Jonu Smith, 60 yards on five catches and has a 57-yard rush to come in as tied in seven with 14.2 points. I do like Jonu Smith. It feels like it's taken forever for him to break out. He is someone who might be on your waiver wire. Grab him. I do think that if they keep Tannehill, they're going to continue to implement Jonu Smith and make him more of a part of the game plan like they have the past couple weeks. John o. Smith could finally see his breakout season next year. I know we've been saying that what feels like three or four years, but this could finally be it. I like John o. Smith. Uh, he's shown a lot to me in the past couple weeks, a guy who still might be available on your waiver wires. As for A.J. Brown, he was still number three. Well, he was the number three wide receiver for me after all the draft stuff and landing spot and everything because I said his talent is just too damn good. One of the things that we talked about multiple times on this podcast, me and Dennis in the offseason, was A.J. Brown thrives in the slot. And if Tannehill eventually took over, that is where he would look. We know all the great years him and Landry had together in Miami. Now, even though Brown has been doing a lot of his work out in the outside, Ryan Tannehill has been going to him. He is by far their number one. 13 targets in this one. The next six to Corey Davis, who unfortunately just 57 yards on three catches, just has not been able to put it together. Regardless, A.J. Brown is a stud. He is going to be a stud moving forward. Get him in your lineup. If you advance and didn't play him this week, he should be in for another big game this weekend. Tennessee does have a tough matchup against the Saints, but guess what? The Saints give up a lot in the air. Should be, I don't want to say a shootout, but A.J. Brown should be able to put up a bunch of points again in this one. Uh, He's had a bunch of good weeks here leading up to this one should do it again next week against the Saints if you didn't listen to me Friday you need to listen to me now just put him in your lineup today get ready get your lineup set for week 16 Brown needs to be in your lineup all right just two games left Eagles and Redskins. Eagles win 37 to 27. Though that final score is a little bit, uh, is not indicative of the way that the game went here. They got a lucky defensive score at the end of the game to kind of stretch that one. Uh, but Carson went 30 of 43, 266 yards and three touchdowns in this one. Does add nine yards on the ground. Comes in at QB5 with 23.5 points. Miles Sanders, I've been saying it. When Jordan Howard, since Jordan Howard has been out, Miles Sanders has been the guy and has been legitimately a stud. He does it again in this one. 122 yards on 19 carries, one touchdown on the ground, adds 50 yards on six catches and a touchdown in the air. Running back three with 32.2 points. Boston Scott, RB28 with just nine points in this one. 26 yards on six carries, 39 yards on seven catches. We talked about it, or I talked about it on Friday. I was really leaning heavily on these tight ends in this one just due to the fact that their wide receivers are beat up. They're trusting guys like, you know, Boston, or Greg Ward Jr., J.J. Ortega Whiteside. So for me, it was going to be all about the tight ends. Both of them have good days here. Dallas Goddard, 55 yards on five catches to come in at tight end 11 with eight points. But Zach Ertz, five catches, 61 yards and a touchdown, targeted 10 times the most out of anybody on this team. And uh, he finishes the week as tight end six with 14.6 points. So they have Dallas this week. Tough matchup, no doubt about it. It's going to this is going to be a huge game because this is likely going to def- to decide who wins the NFC East. So a huge matchup this week, and I think those are really the only guys you can trust again in this one. Ertz, Goddard, Sanders. That's it. I, I don't think you can trust anybody else again. We'll talk more about them obviously, but moving into championship week it is going to be a tough matchup for them, no doubt about it. On the Redskins side, Dwayne Haskins, another good game for him. 19-28, 261 yards and two touchdowns. Does add 26 yards on the ground to come in at QB7 with 21 points. Adrian Peterson takes the reins and goes off, breaking a bunch of records in this one. Uh, moves up the list of touchdowns and rushing yards in the NFL all time. 66 yards on 16 carries and one touchdown. Does add 25 yards on three catches to come in at RB14 with 16.6 points. Terry McLaurin. I said play him. God, I hope you did because he had a huge game. Of course, one touchdown coming, or his touchdown coming on a 75 yard play where he just broke away from the defender, goes the distance, adds altogether 130 yards on five catches, coming in at wide receiver six with 21.5 points. You cannot sit McLaurin. He is just too damn good. We have seen. 
that Haskins has really been improving throughout this season. That connection that those two had at times at Ohio State because it did not it was not there the whole time, and it, it wasn't always there, but they had a decent connection at times at Ohio State. has really started to show itself here in Washington. I like McLaurin. He's going to be a stud moving forward. I think he is easily playable this week again they have the Giants we've seen the Giants can get thrown on Miami just did it to him McCorin great play again this coming week against the Giants all right last but not least and really you probably could say at least again I wanted to get this game in I thought about saving it uh, for tomorrow's game, it was in the, the late game window, and we'll just do one of them. I was going to save all the late games uh, to do with, with Matt tomorrow and then do the Sunday night game, Monday night football game. But I, I want to get this out of the way because it's just obviously crushing and defeating, if you guys know me and, and the team that I'm a fan of. So the Cleveland Browns lose again here to the Arizona Cardinals. 24 to 38. I'm going to start with the Arizona side here first. Kyler Murray has a bounce back game, has a good game. 19 to 25, 219, one touchdown, one interception, and adds 56 yards on the ground. He comes in as QB 18 with 17.4 points. Kenyon Drake. I don't, well, I can't take credit for him because I didn't say you had to start Kenyon Drake, but I did say if you had both of them, you were trying to figure out which one to go with, go with Kenyon Drake. Hopefully you did. RB1 on the week, 39.1 points. He has a monster day here against the Browns. Four touchdowns, 137 yards on 22 carries. Just the one catch for 90 yards, but it didn't matter. Again, just torched the Browns on the ground. Christian Kirk, wide receiver, 45 with 8.1 points. This one, 33 yards on four catches. You had Demir Bird with 86 yards on six catches. Larry the Legend, 42 yards on three catches. All right, the Browns side. Let's talk fantasy first here. Baker Mayfield forced to throw it a lot in this one because they just got behind and had to keep trying to throw to get back into it. 30 of 43, 247, two touchdowns and one interception in this one. QB 15 with 18 points. Nick Chubb continues to be by far the best player on the Browns team. 127 yards on 17 carries and a touchdown. Does add uh, 21 yards on three catches. RB8 with 22.3 points. Kareem Hunt, RB22 with 11.6 points. Continues to be fantasy relevant, even though he's in a timeshare here with Chubb. 14 yards on four carries, but does add 62 yards on eight catches. And then Odell, while not a great day, does have the best day wide receiver-wise. Does get 13 targets, gets eight of them for 66 yards. Could have had more, had a couple big drops in there. Wide receiver, 36 with 10.6 points. Jarvis Landry, huge disappointment in this one. Just gets eight targets, five catches for 23 yards. I mean, there's a huge fight on the sideline. I'll get to that in a minute with them. Ricky Seals-Jones, uh, we know Arizona has been susceptible to tight end points all season long, so if you played him, he came through for you. Two touchdowns, 29 yards, and three catches. All right. Cleveland Browns. I'm going to I'm going to go off on a tangent here so if you guys don't want to listen to this, this is that was the end of the fantasy stuff for the podcast. Me being a Browns fan, this is it's extremely disheartening. I have not this is the first time in a very long time, probably the last time that I can remember hating watching the Browns as much. Even the 0 and 16 season, I was still watching, hoping that they were able to pull out a win, knowing that this team was just not ready to win, and I was not expecting them to. Obviously, didn't want them to go 0 and 16, and has if the Corey Coleman catches that ball, obviously they likely don't. Regardless. I still was watching the games. I've gotten to the point now this season where I don't even watch the games anymore. I turn them off because this is just flat embarrassing. I don't know what is going on with this team, but I am sick of it. Like I'm almost to the point where I cannot even consider myself a Browns fan anymore because I do not want to root for this team. It is embarrassing. Play calling is god awful. Get Kitchens the fuck out of here at this point. Like I mean it. I'm done with it. There's a there's a clip of him standing on the sideline saying, I don't even know what the fuck to do when he's trying to figure out what play call to make. Like, it's just been horrendous. Nick Chubb leads the NFL in rushing. He has been phenomenal. Yet when it is clearly when they need to run, he decides to throw these stupid plays or these crap screen plays that he throws to Landry. That Landry has to throw back to Baker. It's just the dumbest fucking shit in the world. You're not playing high school football. This is a fucking NFL. Get your head out of your fucking ass and play the game. It is ridiculous. This team quit on Freddie Kitchens Sunday. You could see it. The defense was not not tackling. The offense was playing horrible. I don't know if it is them trying to send a message that they don't want Kitchens to be their head coach anymore. And I don't even care if that's what it was. You are a professional fucking athlete. 
play the game. It is extremely embarrassing. I get it. You guys came into the season with a lot of hype. You have a ton of talent on the offensive and the defensive side of the ball. Maybe we should not have hyped you guys up as much as we did. I did think that they would win the division, but I also said many times that I did not think that it was going to be easy for them. I, I thought Pittsburgh was going to go and end up winning the division. Browns getting a wild card spot. You know, obviously that didn't turn out with with Bay, Big Ben getting hurt. Ravens have been phenomenal. I, I, I've been saying it for the past couple weeks. I was wrong on Lamar. I, I needed to see more of him passing. He's shown that to me. He has by far proved that he can pass the ball. Still don't think he's quite as great as everybody says he is, but whatever. I'm not going to get into that argument because then everybody thinks I'm hating on Lamar, and I'm not. He just does not throw the ball as well as people think. A lot of it, I think, comes from the offense and the RPOs. He gets wide open wide receivers. I, Stevie Wonder could go out there and hit a wide open wide receiver, people. Let's calm down on that crap. But regardless, Lamar Jackson, what he does with his legs makes those wide receivers and tight ends so open because the defense has to bite on that. It's all part of the game. They've executed it beautifully. The Ravens deserve everything that they've done, and so has so does Lamar. Lamar deserves all the credit in the world. He's proved everyone wrong Good for him. Good for Baltimore. They deserve it. You know, I don't want to see them win. I'll be honest. Those were the Cleveland Browns. Art Modell just takes that team and fucking up and moves. Fuck them. Fuck the Ravens. That's just me being honest. But good for them. I'm happy. It's not their fault. It's not John Harbaugh's fault. Not Lamar Jackson. Not Mark Ingram. Hollywood Brown. None of their faults. I'm not mad at those guys. I wish them all the success in the world. I don't like to see that franchise win or do good. Again, because that should be the Cleveland Browns right now. They fucked us over. It is what it is. I'm sorry, guys. I get really emotional about this. So, regardless, it's just embarrassing. I hope they get blown out by Baltimore, and I hope they get blown out by the Bengals the last two weeks. It's stupid. It's sad. This team had so much momentum coming into the season. They played so much better. And and something I was talking with someone on Twitter about, I do think a lot of it comes back to John Dorsey making the moves that he made he, he wanted to get all these flashy players on the offensive side of the ball, and he ended up hurting the offensive line, which I think is the key here. You go back to what Baker and this team did last year. A lot of it came from the fact that Baker was not getting sacked and barely getting pressured because that offensive line was so good. I understand that they were playing bad teams. Regardless, one of the teams was the Broncos, and the Broncos, while they were getting some pressures, it was one of the worst games for Baker. We've seen a lot of teams, a lot of quarterbacks struggle when they're getting pressured. When they don't, they have good games. Well, guess what? When Baker was not getting pressured he's had good games that offensive line while it has improved throughout the year is atrocious it needs to be improved we'll see what happens with it regardless the way that team quit this weekend was flat out embarrassing like I am embarrassed to be a Browns fan after watching that performance on Sunday against the Cardinals you know obviously I'm sure they don't care about my opinion they probably don't care what anybody thinks and they they shouldn't but it was just embarrassing I, I hope that eventually they see that like I'm not trying to say all of them quit and I'm sure a lot of those guys were out there playing hard and they didn't want but I'm pretty sure even Kareem Hunt said something like that we just didn't come out we didn't play in the first half like I felt like you didn't play at all not not Kareem Hunt specifically but like the team they said that in the second half they really kind of came out strong I don't believe that at all they got their asses kicked worse in the second half but that's besides the point it's embarrassing Moving forward, I think the only player you can play is Chubb. And and Hunt may be in a flex option spot uh, just because he has been getting a lot of work with them being behind. And they're going to be behind against Baltimore this week. I don't see them at all being able to put together any kind of game plan that, that beats up on Baltimore like they did back in week four or five, whatever it was. So regardless, uh, it's just disappointing. Uh, I, you know, here we go again for the upteenth year in a row. Here's to next year. Hoping, you know, back to believing in the draft again. You know, it was funny. Last year, after the season they had, even though they did technically finish with a hey, losing record, it was, hey, you know what? Like, this isn't about the draft anymore for the Browns. It's all right. Let's get that 2019 season here. Let's see what they can do in the preseason. This is going to be a good year for us. Now it's back to great. What are they going to do in the draft? Because this team is absolute shit, and I don't even know if they're going to be able to do anything. I, I'm not even sure even if what they do in the draft is going to matter. Uh, it's going to be interesting if they make any coaching changes or if anything happens with this team. We've heard a lot of talk about now a bunch of players wanting out. Odell's been trying to get out for weeks. It's it's a mess. We'll definitely jump in and talk about it more in the offseason as, as Dennis is also a, a fan of the Browns as well. So I don't want to get too hyped up on an episode. I feel like I've already gone too long on complaining about him. 
It's frustrating. Um, I, I apologize to everybody who's still here and listening to this. Most of you have probably already turned this off. If you haven't, give us a rate and review. We'd really appreciate that. If you guys have any questions or anything, hit us up on Twitter, me at SportsFanaticMB. You can find Dennis at Culture underscore Coach, Matt Fox at Nighthawk7734, and Tony Dyer at Commissioner MR. We'd be, we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. You can hit us up on DMs as well. Happy to answer any of your questions there. Again, rate and review on iTunes if you guys are on iTunes. Subscribe. really helps us out. We really appreciate it. Other than that, hope you guys, if your games are still in balance this this game tonight with the Saints and the Colts, you end up winning your matchup. Look forward to uh, Week 16 coming up here after tonight to kick off the Fantasy Championships. A lot of games this week. got a Thursday night game, a bunch of Saturday games. So should be a lot of fun uh, this weekend. Looking forward to it. And I'll be back again. Again, with Matt Fox tomorrow to break down the rest of the games. You guys have yourselves a great night. Prepare for glory! I don't know if you got your popcorn ready. If you got your popcorn ready. I came out the wall wide ready. And he's hit the end zone for an unbelievable touchdown. I would be honored if you played football for this team. Throw it up above his head. They can't jump with me. Golly! Only tackle of the 40-yard line. Who can make a play?